Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 21 this morning. I want to make, a, a, make an apology. I was referring to um, going into looking into Paul's shipwreck, but that doesn't happen until the 27th chapter. For some reason, I thought it happened in the 21st chapter. So we're going to still be looking at the pearls of Paul. It was a good title. And um, with that in mind, I want you uh, to turn to Second Corinthians chapter 11, at beginning at verse 21. When I think about the perils of Paul, I think about this particular chapter in uh, Second Corinthians 11. Uh, this man is a remarkable man. God used him in tremendous ways in in ways that um, <laughs> I I just I let the word speak for itself. He's he's defending his apostolic ministry. He's defending the fact that God has used him, and that there are many in the Corinthian church that were boasting and glorifying in themselves that have really done no work. Um, he was um, also chiding them for being fooled by Judaizers who came in among them and uh, that had no qualifications, um, no experience with the Spirit of God, no experience at all really with the workings of God. And uh, he was rebuking this church for getting involved not only with those who were boasting of things they had no knowledge of and no experience with, but they got caught up in boasting among themselves and he says in verse 21 I speak as concerning reproach as though we have been weak howbeit wherein, wherein soever I any is bold I speak foolishly I am bold also are they Hebrews so am I are they Israelites so am I are they the seed of Abraham so am I um, and again the Jews are big on lineage and you know, those who could trace themselves back to Abraham. And Jesus and the apostles made it clear that your lineage alone doesn't really mean anything in terms of you, just because you can be a child of Abraham. Uh, physically wise, human wise, has no bearing upon anything spiritual. Then he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths or near what we would say near death's door or near death often of the jews five times i received 40 stripes save one thrice was i beaten with rods once was i stoned thrice i suffered shipwreck a night uh, and a day i have been in a deep in journeyings often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils of by mine own countrymen in perils by the heathen in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And he goes on to say, uh, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which be blessed, which is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aresis, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes uh, in a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in the basket was I let down by a wall and escaped his hands. In perils, the perils of Paul, perils of the waters, robbers, my own countrymen, the heathen, in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren. It's incredible, this man's life, what he went through for the gospel's sake. And what we don't go through for 
allegedly the gospel's sake. It's incredible to watch this man's life. And then people want to try to quote Paul um, to substantiate a life of non-suffering. It's utterly absurd. It, it is nothing but absurdity. It is a, a intentional misinterpretation of the text of Scripture. It is hellish. There's nothing true about it at all. And I want to look at this before we get to the Acts passage this morning, because this is important. It gives you an idea of the kind of experiences this man had. We talk about his perils. We're going to be looking at some of these very things he's talking about in Acts chapter 21. And frankly, we've been looking at them all through the book of Acts. Of the Jews, five times received thy forty stripes, save one. So, at up until the point of the time of the writing of this particular epistle, Paul had been beaten by uh, Jews and Romans eight times. Okay, eight times up until this point. Okay, so five times he was beaten of Jews, three times he was beaten of the Romans. So of the Jews, he was beaten five times minus, uh, uh, actually 39 stripes. Okay, so he's beaten 39 stripes five times. That's 195 times, correct, if the math is correct. So he's beaten 195 times. I'm sorry, with the 195 stripes, not 195 times. He's beaten five times, a total of 195 stripes on his body from the Jews. And I'm certain there was no magical healing program. Um, and it was clear by the time of this writing that I don't see people that had the gifts of healings healing themselves. If, if you notice that, those that had the gifts of healing never recorded healing themselves. That's very interesting. It may be assumed they did it, but there's no indication that it did because uh, that they did because even Paul mentions that the, the marks of the Lord Jesus were on his body. So clearly that was something that uh, because they had gifts of healings, and it's always expressed in the plural, by the way, uh, that did not necessarily mean that they were able to heal themselves. So he was beaten by the Jews five times. Three times he was beaten with rods, and those are thick sticks. I mean, really thick um, at the hands of the Romans. And there was no number of stripes um, that limited the beatings of the Roman lictor or the Roman torture. They can beat you till they were satisfied. So hundreds of times, with hundreds of stripes rather, not times, hundreds of stripes, Paul was beaten by the hands of Jews and Romans. He was stoned in Lystra. We saw that in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Three times he says he suffered shipwreck. Not once. Three times. And it's interesting because um, there is no mention of his shipwrecks um, the, of the three. And the fact is there is a mention in scripture of the three shipwrecks that that's he just said it so he mentioned it well we don't have any recording of paul being shipwrecked three times yes you do right there he said uh, ship uh, shipwrecked three times so there you go there's your proof right there and that's all the proof that we need and i'm of the opinion these are the three shipwrecks of paul that were done before acts 27 so this was these were shipwrecks he was involved in before the one in Acts. Um, and even during one of those events, he was adrift an entire day in the open sea. I mean, shipping at that time was extremely hazardous. Extremely hazardous. And you only had a limited time, really, to go uh, shipping. You would go in a cargo vessel, primarily, there were no Queen Marys, no ocean liners, no comfort vessels. Primarily, we'll go with a cargo ship. And in the open sea, there was a tremendous danger, as we'll see in the 27th chapter. 
he says, in journeyings often, perils of waters, these are frequent journeys. Um, and he told the Corinthians um, what had happened uh, to him in those journeys. And they're all described as perils. The word perils means dangers. All kinds of dangers. It's incredible again that we see this man, the great apostle. He's suffering everywhere you look. And yet people, <laughs> Americans in particular, they, they, they take this man's great life of suffering and they cheapen it with stupid, cliche memes and pithy sayings. I can do all things through Christ with strength and I saw another one like this. I'm not even getting involved in this foolishness. I can do all things through Christ having nothing, having gone through nothing. It's just a ripping off of the text. It's ignoring the fact that Paul's life as a believer was nothing but perils. The majority of his life was in danger. And I just can't stand it when people just ignore the clear proof that Christianity is a relationship with God that's going to cause you great suffering, great peril. And it's amazing when you look at these perils and perils of waters and perils of robbers. Let's just take a look at this. He experienced great dangers, uh, dangers in travels and rivers, often swollen and difficult to maneuver. We just, they just did not have the technology that we have today to be able to maneuver and to get around dangers like the dangers at sea and dangers in oceans like we do today. I mean, some of our Great ships um, have different kinds of navigational gear, what have you, to be able to, to traverse these huge... I guarantee you, if Paul was in our age with the little rinky-dink cargo ships that he had and some of these vessels I've seen on the Internet going through huge waves, these Coast Guard cutters, amazing that they even survived. That would have been a very short chapter in 27. I mean, huge, huge waves. And they had huge waves in their day. Um, so, again, navigating through the oceans was not something that was a simple thing. Then he talked about perils with robbers. I mean, robbers were in abundance in that day and age. Thieves all over the place. People getting robbed everywhere. Um, then as it is now. He says perils among his own countrymen. So he faced great dangers from his own Jewish brethren. And that's seen throughout the entire book of Acts. In fact, it's seen throughout the entire New Testament with Paul. As I said many times uh, in the Second Corinthians, um, they wanted Paul dead. And I said it in Acts. They wanted Paul dead. They didn't want him wounded. They wanted him gone. Um, he was in great danger by the hands of his own countrymen because they wanted him dead. And he was in little position to escape their grasp. I mean, they followed him everywhere he went. Paul couldn't go anywhere without having Jewish brethren wanting to kill him. These Pharisees that he was a part of in killing believers prior to his own conversion to Christianity, now they want him dead too. He says, perils among the heathen. And these were at the hands primarily before the Roman tribunals. Although the events that took place in Lystra proves uh, that he was safe nowhere in Gentile lands. Nowhere. We saw that in Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 19. We're going to see it here in 21. He was in perils in the city. Any city where Paul went. Um, and we, we saw that the, the Holy Spirit reminded Paul that wherever you go, bonds and afflictions are waiting for you when you get there. He said, I don't know what's going to happen where I go, but I know this. The Holy Spirit made it clear to me that everywhere I go, bonds and afflictions await me. So, it was true. Ephesus was a prime example. When he was there, a great revival and a great riot broke out. And this we already saw in the book of Acts. Um, he perils in the wilderness. Even in the desert, he wasn't safe. It may, have, uh, may be that at this point of the passage that Paul expands his perils to the point that 
he wrote that no matter where he was at, he was never safe. Whether the wilderness or the sea, the sea was no place for him, safe place. He had perils there too. And, and then he had perils among false brethren. And this is probably one of the greatest dangers, if not the greatest danger, that Paul or anyone else faces. I mean, he wrote with great experience because he dealt with literally probably thousands of professing Christians. And his works and ministry, uh, he trusted many men who turned out to be false. This is, this is part of the peril, the perils of Paul. And in, in some minuscule measure, um, and I do say that in America, minuscule as in microscopic measure. In fact, I shouldn't even say it. I'm not even going to finish the sentence. It's not even, it wouldn't be worth saying you look at this man's tremendous life and his perils, weariness and painfulness, watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often, cold and nakedness. I don't think these were voluntary fastings. He, he was starving many times. He was hungry. You know, we got a Americanized Paul that we have the biblical Paul. The biblical Paul is the one I'm interested in. The others are just idolatry, fantasy, nonsense of your own minds. Then he said, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me, he, he, he describes these things as outside of the care of the church. These are things that are in addition to, when it talks about uh, besides those things that are without. So in addition to the things he just mentioned, and I'm sure some things he didn't mention, um, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. The concerns of all the churches, not some of the churches, all the all the churches that God used Paul in to start, he had a daily concern, daily report, a daily care for all the churches and all the saints that were associated individually with those churches. This is the apostle. These are his perils. Who is weak and I'm not weak. If I have a daily concern for all the churches, when one member suffers, I suffer with them. Who is offended and I burn not? I mean, who is offended? Who is who is caused to stumble and I'm not indignant about it? You know, he's in a place where he can't do anything about it. You got Judaizers coming into all these churches and trying to destroy the work which Paul began. God used him in a mighty way to begin these works. And so Paul says, when someone is caused to stumble, I'm indignant about it. Who, who, you know, how, how, how is I don't burn? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I would glory in the things which concern mine infirmities, my weaknesses. We don't do that. We keep saying, when I'm weak, I'm strong. We always want to be on top. Always got to have the last word. Always got to be happy, happy. Paul said, I will glory in my weaknesses, in my frailties, in my sicknesses. I'm going to glory. I will glory in those things which take me out and glorify Christ. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth I lie not. I love that. In Damascus, the governor under Aristus the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me and threw a window in the basket. I was let down by the wall to escape in his hands. So here's a man who knows something about peril. Oops, sorry about that. He knows something about peril. And he teaches us about it too. It's amazing. Incredible. Now, having said all that, Let's take a look at the perils of Paul in Acts 21. Still going to keep the same title because I think it's true. Paul, having now given his final instructions to the pastors of the church or the, the church at Ephesus, he now heads towards Jerusalem with his final destination being Rome. And this is a very interesting chapter for a lot of reasons. I'm going to take my time with it. Very, very important truths in this chapter. Concerning, again, the Holy Spirit, His Word. 
the conflict that people have in, in understanding and misunderstanding the spirit of God's word. If you just approach the Bible, let it speak for itself. You'll be surprised how clear it is. There's so many people approaching the world with their biases. Got to let this stuff go. First one, it came to pass that after we forgotten from them, the them obviously being the elders, in Acts 20, and had launched, we came with the straight course to Coos, or Coos rather, Coos rather, and the day following into Rhodes, and from there to Patera, finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand, and sailed into Syria, and landed in Tyre, for there the ship was un uh, to unlaid her burden. So again, now you're seeing what kind of ship that Paul is on. He's on the cargo vessel. He hitched a ride in the cargo ship. There's no ocean liner. There's no there's no ship. There's no passenger liner. If you want to travel, you better get a, get on board a cargo vessel. Because those were the, the, the best ships to be able to travel. You know, they were able to take the waves for the most part. So, two ships and seven cities later, Paul and his group stay in Tyre while the ship unloads the cargo. Verse 4. And so, what is Paul doing there inside? Finding disciples. It's amazing. Everywhere he goes, he's looking for Christians. Or he's looking to evangelize. He's not looking for a rest, and I got to get on the mountaintop, and I have to get away. No, he's looking for disciples. We just read in 2 Corinthians 11, he had to care for the churches. He's not trying to get away from ministry. He's not so self-centered, thinking about himself and thinking about his personal, what personal comfort? What personal comfort did you see, did I see, does anyone see in here and all of what I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what personal comfort did you see? His life was one of constant perils. We focus on comfort. The foundation of our mentalities, the foundation of our ministries, the, the focus and foundation of all that we do is comfort-based. That's why we're not doing anything. Because everything has to be sieved through a comfort mentality. If it isn't comfortable, I'm not doing it. If it if it takes me from my comforts, I got that protocol don't work. What comfort could you possibly see? In Paul's life. And that's one half of one chapter. 2 Corinthians 11. Incredible. And finding disciples, we tarry there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Hmm, that's interesting. Find the disciples, we tarry there seven days, who said, the disciples, to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Hmm, that's interesting, because Paul's being led by the Spirit to do just that, to go to Jerusalem. So rather than just ignore the apparent conflict, which there is none, we ought to be good students to find out what the deal is. Now, I know it's difficult for many to interpret, I think because we come to, to the passage with a particular bias. Again, I, I just have to say that there are so many biases that many come to their Bibles, they just, and again, they don't, they don't have a mentality, a, a suffering protocol. They don't have a protocol where the, where the Spirit of God is actively involved in doing everything. We, we're comfort-based, we're humanistic, and the Holy Spirit is not dominant. In Scripture, it's God is dominant, the Spirit of God is definitely dominant, and these people are servants to the living God. There was no comfort. 
None. None. So some would approach this and go, there's a contradiction. It's no contradiction. It's never a contradiction. Never. I don't know why we would approach the scriptures. We see something, go, oh, there's a contradiction. It might be in your head. It's no contradiction. Now, let's look at how some tried to solve this problem, how others have tried to solve it, and then we'll see what Harley Howard says, see if it makes sense. Not that I'm the final authority or anything. I'm sure multitudes have probably come to the same conclusion. I, I'm just saying that from what I've read, in all the thousands of books I've read, I haven't seen it. Some say this is not the actual Holy Spirit, but the human spirit. In other words, some have said that it was the desire of the disciples that is here and nothing more. Of course, that's ridiculous. The phrase in this verse, through the Spirit, means the Holy Spirit and nothing else. That's how it's used in Scripture time and time again. So the idea that finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, we said to Paul, through their own spirit or whatever is stupid, that makes no sense. And yet there are people who are I, I I guess just for lack of a better term, scholarly men who believe that this is just the human spirit, that which to me is ridiculous. And sometimes we can be ridiculous. Number two, others have said if you look at verses 4, 12, and 13 together, um, then we have solved the apparent dilemma. So just to humor myself, and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Verse 12 says, And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. 13, then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they say, if you read those three verses together, we solve the parent dilemma. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, because in verse 4, Paul's entire, in verses 12 and 13, he's in Caesarea. I don't think connecting those verses solve anything. I, I think it rather produces a greater problem. Now, I'm going to give you what I hope is the correct view. Take it for what it's worth. I'm not the prophet or son of a prophet I just look at things I, I look at them simply I look at things from a, a bigger picture and I think that uh, the Holy Spirit clearly led Paul to Jerusalem there's no question about that none at all we've seen it in chapters 19 and 20 there's no question that the Holy Spirit led Paul to go to Jerusalem how do you explain that people are saying that be led by the Spirit, or saying that he shouldn't go. Is there a contradiction? No. Not at all. I believe also the Holy Spirit is leading Paul not to go to Jerusalem. You said, wait a minute. You just got finished saying in chapters 19 through 20 that you believe the Holy Spirit is leading Paul to go to Jerusalem, and there's no question about that. And now you're saying in chapter 21... You also believe the Holy Spirit is telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. How is it not a contradiction? How do we solve that problem, Mr. H? Because clearly you have a problem. Nope. Don't have one at all. I believe what we have here is a matter of timing. It's a matter of the Spirit of God putting a temporal hold on Paul to go to Jerusalem. That's all it is. It's a delay. It's an issue of timing. The Spirit of God works in timing as well. That's the answer. It wasn't the time at that moment. But he's going to go. 
but it wasn't the right time. And you're going to see that more clearly, I hope, in verses 8 through 10 when we get there, which should be momentarily. Verse 5, when we had accomplished those days, we departed, went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. We, we had finished our course from Tyre. We came to, um, I used to know all these words. Uh, hmm? Ptolemus. Very good. Thank you. Because the P is silent. Ptolemus. And saluted the brethren. Very good to happen. And, and both with them one day. So two more cities and more fellowship. So I love that everywhere Paul goes, he wants to fellowship. You see people going going out of town, and the last thing on their mind is believers. <laughs> In fact, their mind is not thinking about believers at all. They're thinking about the shore, some beach, some boat, drinking, acting stupid and gluttonous. They're not and, and dancing the night away. They ain't thinking about no saints. I'm going on vacation. Where you go? I'm gonna go get 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 big old fishbowl goblet full of wine and liquor. I ain't thinking about no church. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I'm thinking about a church. In fact, probably nine times out of ten, I'm going to place because of a church and not in spite of a church. I got to be in the fellowship. I, I'm not so stupid as to just go somewhere and not think about the fellowship. What am I trying? <laughs> this this. <laughs> oh golly we are so self-centered we're not even thinking with the biblical mind verse 8 and the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven and abode with him. So when they get to Caesarea, uh, they they abode with uh, Philip, who was one of the original seven men chosen by the congregation in Acts 6. Good to see that uh, the brother's still active. He's called an evangelist. And to me that raised some interesting questions about the men that were chosen in the sixth chapter of Acts. We often hear, and I even refer to them as deacons, um, but they were never referred to as deacons in Acts 6. And when I talk about deacons, if my, if memory serves me correct, I'm not speaking of a specific office. I just use the word diakonos as a slave or a servant. That's all they did was serve tables. But I'm not referring to them, and I don't think I refer to them in Acts 6 as some official office of a deacon. They were just serving tables the highest caliber of men serving tables. And here we see that he's referred to as an evangelist. And it's possible that they were deacons in this, but not an official position, not some official sense that we would call them today. And then um, he used them in, in other ministries. I mean, I recall serving tables in plenty of churches throughout my ministry and life. And then I was acting as a diakonos. As, a, as a, a servant, as a deacon. But I don't have any official title as a deacon. Not at all. But that doesn't mean I can't diakonos. It doesn't mean I can't serve like a deacon. I find it quite enjoyable. I've, I've shocked a lot of churches because, you know, me putting on an apron was anathema to them. Like, why? <laughs> it's like, just be quiet. Take this plate. You know, I'm putting up the chicken and what have you, and people getting heart attacks because they, in their tradition, you don't do that. Well, forget tradition. You know, who is he that is greatest among you? What does the Bible say? Then be the servant of, of all. Just put your apron on and serve. I'm no different. I'm, there's no, listen, there's no... At the risk of sounding like I'm doing it, and I'm not, I'm trying to convince people, I don't know why, 
but this this idea of elevation is not part of my skill set. It's not a part of my mentality. I don't care to be elevated. I only care to serve. That's it. I don't, you know, recognition is not a thing I'm grasping for. Service is. That should be the mentality of everybody. This is all part of a service. What what I'm doing now, what I do in the church is all a part of service. There's no exaltation necessary. None of us deserve anything anyway. I mean, even Stephen was a powerful preacher of the word of God in his brief life as a believer, as a diakonos. <laughs> he was super powerful in that word. Verse 9, the same man had four daughters, virgins did which did prophesy. Very interesting. Very interesting. I'm sorry, this coffee is so good. I, one day I'll tell you the secret to the best coffee ever, but right now it would distract you from the word. Mm. We'll put that cup way over there. So Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Um, the text didn't call them prophets, as Agabus was called a prophet in verse 10. It also does not imply that an ongoing ministry, or any ministry. It just says that they, uh, or th that they were associated with the church. It just says that they prophesied. Okay. There's no indication, at least at this point, that Philip had a church in his home. And, uh, Nothing, and it's interesting because you had mentioned in verse 9 that Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied, yet it was a prophet named Agabus that came down from Judea who prophesied about Paul. You find it interesting? I sure do. He was in the house with that four prophets, or prophetesses, I guess. I guess it's, well, I can't call it, because again, this proves the point they weren't prophetesses, they just prophesied. That's, impo that's an important distinction, okay? Verse 10, as we tarried there many days, there came down, and, and notice that, many days, between the time Paul, okay, between the time that Paul gets to Caesarea, he's heading towards Jerusalem, Many days had taken place. Timing. Hold. Okay? We tired there many days there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Now, again, I believe that this will explain clearly why Paul was on hold, why there was a time period between him getting into Caesarea and then getting to move on. The common Greek word for tarry is the word meno. Meno means to stay. It means a temporary stay. M-E-N-O in the Greek. Meno means to stay. The word used here is epimeno. And the word of the prefix epi in the Greek language strengthens and intensifies the word. In other words, Paul and his group wasn't going anywhere. They stayed at Philip's house. They had no intention to leave at all. Did you get that? Hello? You got the right. So, Epimeno was used here. Okay, so, they weren't leaving. When the Holy Spirit got them to Caesarea and they stayed in Philip's house, they had unpacked. Okay? <laughs> they were there. This was their house. Okay? They stayed in Philip's house. They stayed there. As far as Paul and his team were concerned, home sweet home. It's all important. Paul was as close to Jerusalem as possible, knowing that he wasn't to go there until the Holy Spirit told him to go. He didn't move until Agabus the prophet came from Judea with the following message to Paul. See, again, I just have to keep saying this. 
you have to study the whole Bible. Let me move on. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Same Holy Ghost that told Paul to go in Acts chapters 19 and 20. The same Holy Ghost who told Paul not to go in chapter 21. Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at where? Jerusalem. There you go. Find the man that owneth this girdle. And shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Did you, just, did you get that? Okay. The prophet of God is telling the people there, the Holy Ghost says, the Jews are in Jerusalem are going to bind the man that owneth this girdle, deliver him in the hands of the Gentiles. So, the only way, please forgive my simplicity in this statement, but it has to be said, the only way that Paul, who is now in Caesarea, could be bound by the Jews in Jerusalem to be handed over to the Gentiles is, is he has to go to Jerusalem. Okay the Jews at or in Jerusalem. He can't be, Paul's in Caesarea, he can't be bound by the Jews at or in Jerusalem until and unless he gets to Jerusalem. So the reason why the Holy Spirit had Paul waiting in Caesarea was a timing issue, not a contradiction issue. It wasn't time yet. He had unpacked his bags. He was staying right there. He wasn't going to move until the Holy Ghost said otherwise. And Agabus said, time to go. Notice what Agabus did to Paul and especially what he said to Paul. The Holy Spirit told Paul that he would be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles through Jerusalem. What or who are the Gentiles? The Romans. Those Gentile hands to whom Paul would be delivered into would be the vehicle that would take him to Rome. This is all being done according to the plan of the Holy Spirit. Every bit of it. Which leads me to ask the question, what can we learn from this? What are we learning about the movement of the Holy Spirit since he's dominant in this entire book? Number one, we need to be sensitive to his leading. We need to be sensitive to his leading. We talk about, it's, it's, it's almost like we just have a this or that mentality about the Holy Spirit. It's either this or that. No, clearly, we're, we're looking at an issue of timing here. Oh, he's going to get to Jerusalem. He's going to get to Rome. But the timing that God wanted Paul to wait was clearly outlined here. We need to be sensitive. When I say sensitive, I'm not saying touchy. I'm saying we need to be, we need to really learn to be discerning about what he's doing, about what he is leading us. And that, that's another thing. He's the leading. He's, it's the passive voice. Once again, the action's being done to Paul. Paul's not doing anything. He's not self-leading and then giving the Holy Ghost credit. No, he's waiting. He knows he's going here, and then the Holy Ghost said not to go. He said go, then he gets here, Holy Ghost said, not now. So what does Paul do? He unpacks his bags. Prophet comes down long time later. They tarry long in Caesarea and says, now it's time to go. Sensitive. Very sensitive. And see, this is going to take a life. Oh, man. Oh, man. Hmm. <sighs> If we're not accustomed to a life of ongoing leading by the Spirit, <laughs> we're going to do a lot of stupid things in His name. We must learn that the life 
in the spirit is not an optional thing to do only when we need an answer for what some immediate issue. No, no, no. You're seeing people being led here or there all the time. Number two, we need to understand that the leading of the Spirit does not always lead us into a place of comfort and away from trouble. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. Why is it that the Holy Spirit leads Paul and tells him that every city bonds and afflictions await you? But it doesn't do it to you or to me. Why is it that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to meet the devil? Why does the Holy Spirit do that to Christ, but never to you? Never to be tested of the devil. Why not you? Why is it the Holy Spirit leads Philip from a revival to the desert. Why does he... Uh, desert. Why does he... Not desert, but desert. Why does he do that to Philip, but never you and me? Why does the Holy Spirit fill Stephen with great boldness and he gets killed? Why does the Holy Spirit never do that to you or to me? I can go on and on and on. This exercise is in the Word of God that you and I keep claiming to know. And yet, there are all these passages, and yet we act like they're not there. They're, they're not for Americans. Ours is a comfort-based mentality. And everything is sieved through that. Everything is... You know, sift it. Remember the old sifter? You put the flour in there, you, you turn a crank because you want to make sure there was no lumps. So the sifter would squash the flour, make sure there were no lumps. That's what we do. No lumps. We don't like lumps in our lives. You like a nice comfort-based protocol. You know, that's what we like. It's not a reality, but we like it. And then we try to reconcile our comfort lifestyle and the conflict in Scripture by recreating what the Bible actually teaches for us. It's absolute nonsense. Demonic nonsense. The Holy Spirit does not always... In fact, I look in Scripture, I, I, I don't see where the Holy Spirit has been leading anybody to comfort away from trouble. Can you show me where? I don't see it. I don't see it at all. Nowhere. Why does the Holy Spirit lead Peter and others to stand before all the religious elite of that day and boldly call them murderers of the Messiah? But you, you're never being led to be bold to speak against the religious establishment and call it for what it is. Heretical nonsense. And killers of, of salvation to those whose souls need to hear about Christ. How come he never does that to you, to me? Hmm. I always wonder about that. Comfort? Ease? Away from trouble? It's a damnable lie. Number three, we have a desperate need of exposition of the word and learning because these things are necessary for us to understand what's actually being said as opposed to me taking the text and recreating what it actually says which has nothing to do with what it actually says it's just for you no it's not it's for you to understand what God is saying, not what God is saying to you, but what God is saying, period. You're not the focus. It's what God is saying, and I need to get myself in line with what the Word is saying. The focus is not upon me. It's still about Him. While Paul was in Caesarea waiting for the leading of God to go to Jerusalem, Agabus the prophet comes down from Jerusalem and prophesies that Paul would be bound in Jerusalem delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. 
these same Gentile hands would be used to bring Paul to his divine destination, and that is Rome. Paul perceives this to be the movement of God, and the people who were, were with him knew it, and they responded with love. Verse 12, And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Listen, I get it. They love Paul. I mean, he lived with them. And I'm sure they loved him. The we, by the way, refers to Luke as well, and the traveling companions of Paul, as well as Philip, and those who lived with Philip. They begged him not to go to Jerusalem. They pleaded with him not to go. But look at Paul's reply. Before I get to Paul's reply, I get it. They didn't want him to go, because they loved him. He had to go. <laughs> okay? He didn't have no choice. He didn't live by choices like we do today. Everything's a choice. I get to choose to obey God or not. No, Paul said, verse 13, What me ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. What are you crying for? Why are you you're, you're crying... And because of your concern to crush my heart, why? It was tough for Paul. I mean, he's seen these people who really love him, and they're crying. And th then this isn't just uh, <laughs> that. That's not what's going on. That's the, they're talking about wailing. We're talking wailing or mourning or be wail aloud to cry as as if you were in, in mourning in a funeral. I mean, this is some serious serious tears going on here they love paul that much and that display crushed his heart as he observed the people pleading with him not to go to jerusalem but paul's personal concern was not an issue why was that okay go go further back let's see if you connect the dots why was it that paul's personal concern was not an issue with them Very good. See how it all connects together? He did not count his life as something to hold on to. Very good. Very good. That's connecting the dots. He already mentioned previously to the Ephesian elders that my life is not something to hold on to. My life was not a priority. He just keeps demonstrating the same truth. Never wavers from the truth. Never wavers from the leading of the Spirit of God. It's all there for us to see. He doesn't serve God because it's convenient or without pain or even the threat of death. He doesn't, he doesn't serve God when it's convenient like many do today. It's all convenience. They serve with the comfort orientation. That's all it is. If it ain't comfortable, I'm not doing it. it must not be of God. And and all the things, like I said earlier about about that list in Second Corinthians nine. Second Corinthians eleven, rather, that's just one of many lists. In Romans eight, he talks about he calls it. I think another Corinthian epistle calls it light afflictions. Romans eight, he refers to these trials as well. So again, you have him calling these light afflictions. One of those would take us out. One of the listen. One of those hitters, we become Mormons tomorrow, okay? Because <laughs> we ain't going through nothing. <laughs> One that would take people out of the church in a minute. Because their whole comfort orientation takes them out anyway. They're already out. They don't realize it yet. Paul says that tears, no matter how sincere, bonds and death are no match for obedience to God. I'm ready to die for Jesus, and because of that, I'm ready to live for him in obedience. It's just that simple. It really is just that simple. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, will the Lord be done? I, I, I'm not saying this in any... How, how can I put this? Critical... Critical light against the church at that time in... in Philip's house. I'm just saying they were wrong. And, and, and I, only, I, I only say that because 
they did not have the understanding that Paul had when God gave the instruction to Paul. So their love and their desire for Paul not to go isn't because they did know everything that Paul was instructed by the Spirit to do, Acts 19, Acts 20, etc. All the chapters we studied already. I don't think they knew at all. But when Agabus said it was time to go, they're just responding to the fact that, well, please don't go, we love you, etc. They're wrong in doing that, but they don't know they don't know what Paul knew. So in a sense, it's you know, I hate to be that way because they're a great loving church, but they were wrong in trying to dissuade him from being obedient. Sometimes we allow the closest to us to persuade us from obedience to God. See it time and time. I see it time and time again. Sometimes the worst people in your life are your family. I'll say it. They're the worst people in your life. You want to obey God. You got all these family members who aren't thinking with a biblical orientation but a comfort orientation. If others attempt to persuade us from obedience to God, no matter what the cost, we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than family. We must obey God, period. For the family, friends, or church attempt to persuade us from doing that which is commanded from God, we who are family, friends, and a congregation should encourage them to go forward in obedience to God. We should encourage them to obey God. Thank God that Paul would not be persuaded. Thank God he would not be persuaded. He would not change his mind even for those who loved him the most. God loved him more, used him to do his bidding. Finally, the loving saints conceded that Paul is walking in the will of God and they yielded to his will. They said, the will of the Lord be done. And that, that should be it. And that was it. That ended it all. Lord willing, tonight, I thought we'd get finished with this. But uh, clearly, <laughs> that was not the case. But uh, Lord willing, tonight, at least we'll continue. This is, this is a great, great chapter. Many, many wonderful lessons we can learn here. Lord, again, thank you for your wonderful truth. Always wonderful. Always, always wonderful. And may it touch many hearts today, Lord. May you be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Lord willing, we will continue this uh, this evening. And uh, may God bless those who are watching. See you at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, California time. We'll see you this evening. God bless.